Listen. Perhaps you catch a hint of an ancient state not quite forgotten. Dim, perhaps, and yet not altogether unfamiliar. Like a song whose name is long forgotten and the circumstances in which you heard completely unremembered. Listen. Not the whole song has stayed with you, but just a little wisp of melody, attached not to a person or a place or anything particular. But you remember, from just this little part, how lovely was the song, how wonderful the setting where you heard it, and how you loved those who were there and listened with you. Listen. These are not ordinary books. They were dictated, not written. They are about love, about forgiveness, and about inner peace. They contain a whole philosophy for living in our times. And this is the story of how they came into being. In 1958, I accepted an appointment as professor of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. Shortly after I arrived at Columbia, one of my first duties was to hire a research psychologist for a special collaborative study program. In the course of looking for the right person, I found Dr. Helen Shuckman. Helen and I worked together very closely for the next seven years on a wide variety of academic, professional, clinical, and administrative issues. For the most part, I think we worked quite effectively. But there was also a great deal of conflict and stress in our personal and professional relationships. In her unpublished autobiography, Helen, who died on February 9th, 1981, described her reactions to her job and the highly stressful situations that existed there. I was a psychologist, educator, conservative in theory and atheistic in belief. I was working in a prestigious and highly academic setting, and the job was ghastly at first. The hospital didn't provide space for our projects, and when we were finally housed in the new research building, it was the most difficult situation of my professional life. The work was oppressive and carried out in an atmosphere of suspicion and competitiveness, and interpersonal harmony was depressingly lacking. Then something happened that triggered a chain of events I could never have predicted. My first impressions of Helen were a little difficult to define. She seemed to me to be a very complex person. On the one hand, she was obviously brilliant. She certainly had a very dedicated research orientation. On the other hand, there was a kind of peripheral feeling of orbiting, and I'm not quite sure how to define that, but a feeling that she was going in circles somehow. And it took me a while to realize that that was a very superficial impression, and that any question I asked her uh, evoked a very uh, solid answer. Often, Helen and I would leave our offices in the late afternoon, while we were working on a project or a paper and spend some time near my apartment in Central Park. I felt extremely close to Helen. I felt she was the one person who cared about what happened in my professional life. But I also think she felt a much closer personal relationship with me than I felt I could reciprocate. Bill is some 14 years younger than I and over a foot taller. 
He rarely attacked openly when he was angry or irritated, but was much more likely to become increasingly aloof and unresponsive. I, on the other hand, tended to become over-involved and then feel hopelessly trapped and resentful. Helen related in a very professional way with patients that with some people she tuned in immediately and had a great sense of rapport. She understood what they were like. She was able to perhaps see through their defenses and uh, was extremely practical. I was having some emotional difficulties, uh, largely with family matters. And uh, so Helen kindly counseled me. And in the course of this dialogue, a very kind exchange, uh, she discovered that uh, I'd been separated from my mother for some 14 years. And I really wasn't quite sure where she was. It turned out that she was institutionalized. And within half an hour the next day, Helen located through some contacts in the State Department of Mental Health in New York State, uh, found where my mother was lodged, and had caught, spoken to the physician in charge of my mother, and the following Sunday arranged for me to visit. And with Helen's support and help, I was uh, able to reestablish a, a very loving relationship uh, with my mother, uh, first as a friend and then as a loving son. And it was so typical of, of Helen's concern. We had worked together for a number of years, actually from 1958 until the summer of 1965, with a good deal of improvement in terms of the organization of the psychology department at the hospital. But we weren't really at peace. And one day I gave Helen a little speech this was in June of 1965, before we were going to a meeting. Essentially what I said is, there must be a better way of living and working in the world, of handling our personal and professional relationships and problems, and I'm determined to find it. Uh, this was kind of a long speech for me, and I remember feeling at the end of this that Helen probably was going to laugh, but to my amazement, quite the contrary. She said, you're absolutely right, Bill. We'll find this other way together. And that was the beginning of a joint commitment which the two of us made. Helen was always very much involved in her work with mentally retarded children. ...way together. And that was the beginning of a joint commitment which the two of us made. Helen was always very much involved in her work with mentally retarded children. She found particular gratification in working with children who had these handicaps and found them especially responsive and highly lovable. On the other hand, Helen would have been the first to assure any of us that she would not have made a good mother herself and had no wish to assume that role. When we walked in Central Park, as we often did, we would visit Lewis Carroll's Ellis in Wonderland near the boating pond, and that was one of Helen's favorite spots. On one of these occasions, Helen told me about a recurring childhood dream from which she never quite recovered. It centered on a red and yellow rubber ball which showed up in many dreams over the years and which she equated with unhappy aspects of her childhood. The ball was in the crib at the foot. And my father came into the doorway, and I was lying there very happily thinking how pretty I was and how warm. He just stayed there and looked and didn't come in. And I was very little, so I couldn't get up myself and go over. dream, I saw myself turn from a very pretty little girl into a very ugly one. And he just looked and then went away. 
I did turn into a very ugly girl. I was fat and horrible and all the boys turned me down. My mother said I looked like an elephant and she couldn't stand it. Helen had a very lonely childhood. Her mother and father had lives of their own and she had nothing in common with her brother who was 14 years older. She spent most of her time with a Catholic governess and a Baptist cook. Helen's parents were non-observant Jews and there was no discouragement or interest when Helen started to experiment with being, at different times, Catholic and Baptist. After a long series of disappointments, Helen gave up her search for God and when she became a graduate student in psychology, her belief shifted from agnosticism to angry atheism. But that, as it turned out, was not the real end of the story. Ever since I was a child, I would often see very clear pictures when I closed my eyes. The pictures could be of anything. A birthday cake with lighted candles, a woman with a dog, trees in the woods, a store window filled with shoes. For years, my mental pictures had usually been motionless and in black and white. I could become aware of them at any time, even with my eyes open. But suddenly they began to appear in color and in motion. And so did my dreams. The summer of 1965 was a, uh, an extraordinary summer for both Helen and me in a number of ways. Helen began to have a great deal of what you might call heightened visual imagery or dream sequences. Uh, she began to experience this with considerable clarity and I suggested that she write down these experiences as they occurred because they seemed to have something they were saying something very important even though we didn't know exactly what that was. One of those sequences uh, involved being in a boat. The boat was moving slowly but easily along a very straight little canal. was just enough breeze to help the boat along. The sides of the canal were lined with lovely old trees and edged with banks of flowers. I wonder if there is buried treasure here, I thought to myself dreamily. I shouldn't be surprised if there were. Then I noticed a long pole with a large hook on the end lying on the bottom of the boat. Just the thing, I thought, dropping the hook into the water and reaching the pole down as far as I could. The hook caught something heavy, and I raised it with difficulty. It was an ancient treasure chest. The word worn from the...